Uh, we are uh, just getting underway uh, with our series on Revelation. I have no idea how long this is going to last. Um, oftentimes, I will plan something for four weeks or for six weeks, but this is going to be comprised of a lot of mini series within this greater book. And uh, we, we started this, and someone estimated uh, for me that it was going to take about 200 years um, at the rate I was progressing, because we looked at one word the first week and another word the second week, so I promised today I would not do a word study. Uh, and we're, we're going to look at a bigger portion of, of text today. So with that in mind, I'd encourage you to uh, take out your, your device and maybe you can go to Bible.com, BibleGateway.com, if you have a paper Bible. Uh, we are in the last book of, uh, of the Bible, the last book of the New Testament. Uh, a lot of people have, uh, have some fears of this book, but one of the first words that Jesus speaks directly to a person, in particular uh, John, who is the author of this book, uh, he says to John, do not be afraid. So I want to encourage you, uh, whatever you may have heard about this book, uh, whatever you're hearing, even as I speak and talking about this endless series, um, do not be afraid. Uh, and even this morning, uh, do not be afraid. It's taken a little bit while to load my uh, deal. If you guys can give me the uh, first screen, that would be fantastic. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to begin by, by reading an extended portion of Scripture. And some of you may be wondering, why do I have a towel on, the, uh, on my speaker's table here? And that's because this thing is going to be so darn long and, and exhausting, I have to wipe my... F no, that's not what it's about. Because this series is entitled The Unveiling, right? And so uh, let's go there and uh, look at Revelation. I'm going to read this entire chapter, because we want to get beyond one word, right? Okay. The unveiling from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve God and his Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind, behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned and I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. 
His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Blessed are we who read and who hear the words of this book. Let's pray. Lord God, we, uh, we thank you that you love us enough to send Jesus. And you loved us enough to, to alert your people to his coming. And you loved us enough to let him go all the way to the cross to take our sins and our guilt and our shame, our broken, messed upness, all the way to the cross and say, it is finished. It's done. It is paid for. Don't carry it yourselves anymore. Be free. And then you saw fit to, to raise him from the dead and to let him present himself to over 500 people during the 40 days that he walked following his resurrection. And then in your wisdom, you, you brought him into heaven. And the angel pronounced, why are you staring up at where Jesus was? He will be coming back again in the same manner in which he left. And so God, we... We, we look forward to that and we, we realize it's not a huge part of our culture anymore. But God, we pray that you would help us to take our perspective off the things of humans, take our perspective off of politics or economics or business or, or whatever it might be which, which captures our primary attention. And God, put our primary attention back on you and what you are planning for us. We thank you for it. Open our hearts and our minds to your word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We heard uh, just a few moments ago these, these words. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And you you read that, and you you think through the words, and uh, maybe, or you just kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of flyover territory, isn't it? I mean, a lot of letters in the, the New Testament begins with the words that the Apostle Paul made famous, and that's those opening words right there, grace and peace to you. But, you know, sometimes we need to just, especially wherever we might find ourselves today, we, we need to kind of think on these words a little bit and spend some time there. It's like, like a good meal. Debbie made some. I, I, we were, I was driving up north to meet Debbie the other day, and, uh, and she had mixed up some, some sausages and some shrimp and some tomato sauce and some rice. And, and I walked in, and it smelled so good, you know, and it made three and a half hours of driving totally worth it. And uh, afterwards, it made it totally worth it, too. But... Um, but But the meal in and of itself, you know? And that's what these words are like. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you from from God. You know, we we are a people. How how many of you would, 
love to have more peace in your life. At about 5.40, if you're watching the 5.30 news, how many would like to have more peace in your life? You know? Where does that peace come from? It, it, it's really interesting because this became the standard greeting in the first century. When one believer would come up to another believer, if, if, if one was, was communicating to another believer, their, their opening words, because of what the Apostle Paul did, they, they, it would be grace and peace to you from God. A reminder that, that we're, we're, we're not going to find the peace that we long for through the stuff that we pursue, but it comes from what? What's the first word? Never are these two words swapped. It's never peace and grace to you. It's always grace and peace to you. Why? Because the peace flows from the grace. And when you know the grace, and I know it's corny, but what does grace mean? G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. And when you know that, when you know that the forgiveness which is yours, when you know the love which brought him all the way to the cross, when you know that grace, no matter what's going on, that brings a certain degree of ultimate peace to you. And you see, that's the overall message of this book, that in times of difficulty, that peace can flow to you through the grace of God. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ. And as, as a person who reads the Bible, there's a lot of things in here that are causing me confusion. Because nothing's in the order that it's expected to be in. But let's see if you can catch on to that. Verse 5, And from G Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. And then a phrase is picked up again in verse 8, and it says, God, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And... No, I'm just put that up here. What, what's odd about that? We, we just sang a song, the second song today. I'm really glad that Chris planned that. Actually, uh, Chris and I and, and Scott often marvel. We, we don't communicate a whole lot. I mean, this week is the first time in a long time I said, we need to do this song. And, uh, but I did not plan the second song. And the second song is... Uh, is, is based on something from uh, Revelation chapter 4. See, we expect these words to be different. And from, in Revelation chapter 4, we just got done singing a few minutes ago, it says this, that the angels in, in heaven never stop saying, say it with me, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's the way that that phrase is almost always used. In the creeds, it says uh, it has that, that, that order, the past, the present, the future. But what I want you to see is that when, when this book was, was coming into being, what, what God gave as his revelation to John, as his unveiling to John, look at the difference now, okay? Grace and peace to you, will you say this with me? From him who is and who was and who is to come. And let's just continue. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. What's the difference? We expect who was, who is, and who is to come, but the words are flipped around. And you have to understand that, that when, when, when God inspires something, he means it to be swapped around when it is swapped around. Okay? If something's out of place, it forces us to ask a question. It's, why? I mean, this happens to me all the time. 
I walk into the house. I see something out of place. I say, why is it there? It belongs here. Debbie will come into the room and she'll say, why did you move that? You know, and it kind of goes back and forth. Why did you move that? You know, it, 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 you know. So when, when when something's out of place, we 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 should we should ask why. And some of you are saying, "Well, I, I would never know that's out of place." Well, that's okay. That's why you come here, right? To weird look at the the weirdness. But Damagata said something to me the other day. He's like, "You you you, you look at these minuscule things." And remember that a month ago? I, I don't know what that was about. Um, but that's, that's what I, I don't know. That's the way God wired me. So I'm just weird. So you have to ask the question, why? Why does God emphasize that he is the Almighty who is? Well, it kind of pushes us back into the Bible. There is, remember I shared this um, a couple weeks ago, that in the book of Revelation, almost every other verse has a reference to the Old Testament. I mean, there is no way that a human being put this book together. It is so intricately crafted with all of these cross-references. And, and here's, here's one of the first ones. And it goes all the way back to uh, one of the first uh, big stories in the Bible uh, from Exodus chapter 3. And you probably know this story. Uh, you've, you've heard it. You've maybe seen it on TV. And um, it's about Moses and the burning. See, you've seen it. Um, and... The, the, the deal is that, that God has, uh, has separated out Moses for, for a special mission, mission impossible, if you will. And uh, his, God's people, the Israelites, are, are in captivity in Egypt, and he has raised up Moses. Moses has seemingly put a, kind of a wrench in the whole works because realizing that he himself was, was Jewish and he didn't appreciate the way his, his Jewish people were being treated, he ended up trying to, to intervene for another person and he ended up killing a guy. And so Moses is on the run. He is a fugitive from justice. And in Exodus chapter 3, he's uh, hanging out uh, with in, t- taking care of his father-in-law's animals. He was a, he was a farmer. And so he is now a a farmhand. And so it says this, Moses was tending his father-in-law Jethro's flock, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. And so Moses thought, that's weird. Why doesn't the bush burn? Why isn't it burned up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from within the bush, Moses, wait, (laughs) every excuse, Moses, Moses. God's calling. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is... You guys do know this story. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come now to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I've seen the way the, Egypt, the, the Egyptians are oppressing them. And at this point, Moses is like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. You're, you're, you're going to free them. Yeah, yeah. And then God says, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. <laughs> and he says, oh, thank you very much. I don't think so. But then Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I'll be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. 
When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And, and he's like, uh, that's a sign. That's like a sign after it's done. Can you give me like a sign right now? What, the burning bush isn't enough? And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What shall I tell them? Now note this. I have it on screen for you. Exodus 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now notice, before he identified himself as the God of Abraham, of Jacob, and of Isaac, he identified himself in terms of the past. But now what he's doing is he's saying, I am not just a God of the past, buddy. I am a God of the present. I am a God of the here and the now. You tell the people that I am who I am has sent you. And then he goes on to say that that name will become his name from here forward. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And that name uh, was regarded as so reverent that, that the people were never allowed, and to this day, do not form those syllables on their tongues and on their lips. You will sometimes, if you're reading something from an Orthodox Jew, you will see uh, the name even of God spelled G asterisk asterisk because they don't want to say it. But when, when you took those letters from the Hebrew, it formed what, what we refer to as Yahweh or as Jehovah. And, and the, the Israelites would only spell out the letters in consonants, never adding vowels. In fact, they, they, they dropped all the vowels out of their language so that someone wouldn't accidentally say the name. And you say, well, that makes for a confusing language. It sure does, believe me. I think I got a C minus in that class. I don't know what it was, but Hebrew is a tough language. And so here it is. From, from the very beginning of the story, practically, God's name is, say it with me, I am that I am. And so now here is Here is John hearing about this and God identifies himself uh, in terms of these very words. And he says, as we just got done reading, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, why is that important? What's important about that for John? And we, we, we find that in, uh, in verse 9. He and the people that he's writing to, they, they, they need it because of what he reveals in verse 9. And John says this, I, John, your brother and fellow participant in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And if you think, oh, well, that sounds pretty sweet. You know, I wouldn't mind being on an Aegean island and, you know, just kind of soaking up the rays. But what you have to understand is that Patmos substituted in the, the, the name Alcatraz there. Okay? Because it was worse than Alcatraz. 13 square miles of rock and rocky mountain. 30 miles off the coast. 40 miles from the nearest city. And Domitian, the emperor of the, of the Roman Empire that John was being persecuted by, because he refused to bend his knee to the emperor and continued to lift up the name of Jesus. He was on that because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was exiled. He was a political exile 
at Alcatraz. Only, what, 30 times worse? And so, when God speaks to him, he uses these words that take him back. And he says, I understand that it's difficult. Hey guys, can you give me uh, slide 14, please? Just the next one down from that. I know it's difficult. And so grace and peace to you from the I am that I am, the God who is, and who was and who is to come. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That is, I am the, the, the beginning and the end. But, but not just that. It didn't mean that to, to those people. It meant, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am A to Z, but I'm everything in between. I, I'm everything in between. So no so matter what you're facing, if, if, if you're facing CDE, I'm there. If you're facing QRS, I am there. If you're facing, and I never got this right in elementary school, elemental P, I never knew what an elemental P was. Um, and then I finally figured it out. I was kind of slow. I, didn't, I was not operating with all 52 cards early on in my life. Um, L-M-N-O-P. Uh, if, if, if that's where you are, then, you know, God is there. God is there. We need that message because, you see, the, the, the people who were first hearing this book, and remember, the Bible is written for us but not to us. It was written to people in the first century who were suffering and who were getting the snot beat out of them by, by Domitian for not doing what he wanted them to do, and that is to worship him. And so if we were gathering in a church like this, we would have people with ARs coming in that door right now and saying, you stop what you're doing right now. Cut out that music stuff. What do you think you're doing? And he's saying, I know what you're going through, and I am here for you now. You see, the message of this text is that, go ahead and give me uh, slide 15, please. Um, our Heavenly Father, we say this with me, our Heavenly Father is the God of our is. You know, it's so tempting to, to make God the God of the past. Oh, we, we, we have this, what I heard one person refer to, not here, but uh, actually a theologian, refer to as this dusty old book. We have this, this dusty history. I'm not going to refer to this as a dusty old book. But we, we, we have this dusty history. And we have some hopes in the future. That is, God is back there and God is out there, but God is not right here. Have you ever felt that? When life sucks and then you die? That God is not here? You're working on a car and you're making a cut and you cut in the wrong spot. You know, God, why did you let me do that? Or you get pink slipped. Or you get a performance review and a performance improvement plan. Or you lose a major investment. Or worse, you lose a loved one. And you think, where is God? Where is God? And one of the biggest purposes of this book of Revelation, right out of the gates, in switching these little words around, he's saying, I am right here. And I've got you. I've got this. And I know it sucks right now. But it sucked for me too. It was so bad, I cried out, God, my God, why are you forsaking me? But, but, the robe I'm wearing is dipped in blood, but the blood is my own. 
and I did this for you. I am here for you. And you see, that's the good news of this book. Our heavenly Father is the God of our is, and our heavenly Father is the almighty God of our is. Because he's the almighty who was, and he is the almighty who is to come. You see, that is what this book is about. And I look forward to just unpacking this with you. I was anticipating going into Revelation chapters 2 and 3 uh, this, the, these next weeks uh, and taking us through the summer. There are seven little postcards to, uh, to seven uh, churches that, that John is writing to. And he brings them hope because they are going through some difficult times and he points out to them things that they can do, changes that, that they can make, decisions that they can make in order to find that that peace that they need. The grace is there, but unless they say yes to the grace, they're not going to experience the peace. Did you hear that? Unless you say yes to the grace, unless you, you, you receive the gift and you, you unwrap the gift. A lot, lot of us have received the gift, but, but we don't bother unwrapping the gift and finding out what's inside. And that's what we find out in the coming weeks. And when you do that, then the peace flows, and that's the importance of this book. Why most churches don't teach this book? It's because they're chicken. Because it's controversial. Because there are different interpretations. Ooh! Like, you know, everything isn't that way. You know, let's just go there, yeah? You want to go there with me? Oh, too bad. We're going there anyway. Um, uh, but dads, I want to leave you with something. Because the God of our is means that he is present for us. And I want to challenge you dads to be the dad of there is. You see, one of the great privileges that we have as dads, and um, a lot of people say, well, these kids didn't come with any instruction manual. Well, that's because you haven't bothered to read it. In fact, they did come with an instruction manual. And it's right here. And if you're too much of a chicken, sh um, I didn't say it, to read this and to put two and two together and to figure out that we have an example to follow, then that's on you. I don't mean to beat up on you dads, but we're guys and you can take it. And I can take it. But what, what, what I take away from this and who God is is that if God's going to be present for me as a dad, I should be present for my kids just as he's present for his. And I will be the first to confess. Sandler, you had a time of confession up here, right? There are times when we just aren't present for our kids. And it's because we're wired to be so stinking laser focused. And, you know, I, women have so much more on us. They are such better multitaskers than, than we ever could be. But God has given us this laser focus. And when we get into something, baby, we tear into that. Let me tell you real quick, 908. Sure, I'll do it. Um, you know, the, 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 the God of the is, I, I experienced that this week. Debbie and I are, are uh, clearing some land up, up north, uh, some, a family property that's been in the family for 100 years now. And uh, just all of these trees that, that we have to thin down and so we're, at first it was like, oh, you think we should cut this one down? Oh, I think we ought to pray about that one, you know. And it's like, 
Now it's like, zing, 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 zing. And so Debbie is out there uh, just, you know, just working her tail off. And, and I, I, I look at this tree and has some brown branches on the bottom. And I call over to her, hey, babe, should I just take, take the branches or the whole tree? She said, take the whole stinking tree. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like, fine with me. And I look at it, and uh, I judge it to be about 25 feet tall. And so I, I put my, my, my V in there, and uh, it, it starts to fall, but not in the direction of the V. But now I have to pause for a second. Back when Debbie re re uh, received her first retirement checks, that were, they came to her in a group. She said, oh, I could buy myself my own truck. I've wanted a truck for 30 years. I'm going to go get myself a truck. And my wife never says things like this. And so I'm like all over it. Hey, baby, what truck do you want? <laughs> you know, <laughs> can I drive it? And uh, can I take it to Ring Brothers and have it lowered? It's a Maverick. It looks really cool when it, you know, it's low to start with. Can you imagine dropping that thing to just right off the ground? Oh, man. Chop and channel that thing, and it would be sweet. Um, but no. Uh, so anyway, so I cut the wedge. The trailer that she's packing is on the back of, of her new truck. And oh, crap. 25 feet. I don't know how it happened, but 25 feet grew to about 45 feet in two seconds. And... It goes right on the roof of her car. <laughs> and, and, and I run, run, run down there, and all I see before me is my death. <laughs> and I grab the top of that tree, and I lift it up, and I'm saying, dear Lord Jesus, please help the workouts that I've been doing work. And I have an 18-inch bar chainsaw in my hand, and I pull the trigger, and it's, it's, it's electric. Buy electric chainsaws. They are great. I didn't have to do any of this stuff. And, and I said, God, give me the energy. And, and the God of the is was there for me, and he saved my bacon. <laughs> And she walked over and said, it's got a big dent. And I said, it does not. It was a balsam tree. It was like putting a Christmas tree on top of the car for crying out loud. But where, how it grew 20 extra feet, I'll never know. <laughs> it was just God trying to prove himself. But you see, what's my point? I don't have any idea, except that was just a fun story. No. <laughs> The point, <laughs> the point is that God is present for us. He, he spoke to me through that whole thing, even when my wife was screaming at me and I was saying, I know, I'm just, <laughs> you were screaming in my head, baby. You didn't have to say a word. It was in my ears. It was in that space between the left ear and the right ear, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we need to be there. Even when our kids screw up, we need to be attending to them. When our kids call up, I am blessed to have kids who call me over their lunch hour. You know, and sometimes it's annoying. <laughs> but most of you know that it's a rare time when I just hit ignore. I'll usually say, hey, babe, you walk in? Yeah, okay. And we talk later. But you know, I got to cycle back to that. Dads, we have to be there for our kids. It doesn't matter if they are 2 or 12 or 42, whatever they are. If you have the opportunity to be there for your kids, even if you're, maybe you're not getting the opportunity, find ways to make the opportunity to be there for your kids. And I have a gift for you. A lot of us have dad issues. Whenever my dad tried to clear the property that we're clearing right now, it was like once every 10 years, he'd get out the rakes 
and my brother and I would roll our eyes, and he'd light wet leaves on fire, and as my brother described it once, made it a living hell. <laughs> you know, dad, dad was a great dad. But maybe you had a dad who did some bad things. And uh, someone gave this to me last year, and it's called My Father. And it says, my father loves me, cares for me, forgives me, is compassionate, is giving, is understanding, is accepting, is reason, pardons, heals, redeems, is loving kindness. My father renews, is righteous, is gracious, and is sovereign. We all need this, to be reminded of what our dad is to us. And guys, that we can be excellent dads to the kids he's entrusted to us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your love. And I thank you, God, that the book of Revelation is not doom and gloom, but it is hope. That God is not the author. You are not the author of, of blood and gore, but that the world is that author. And you say, I am there with you in the midst of this, and I will get you through. God, send us from this place filled with the hope of your word and with your love, and with your grace, and with your peace. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.